Three, two, one, here we go. Episode 187 of the Last Breath Huntcast. Thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Garrett, and today I'm going to talk to you about my mule deer hunt up and coming that actually is uh, about two and a half weeks away from now. I'm going to go through, you know, what I've been doing physically to get ready, um, <clears throat> what I've been doing as far as shooting gear preparation, um, what I had to do to be able to get the tag, uh, to, to even get a chance to go and do this stuff and uh, dive into it. So if you're thinking about going out west, um, specifically mule deer or anything high country, this might help you out, give you some insight because um, this is my first trip out west, but and every time I go, I seem to add more gear to my cache for my western adventures. And this will kind of help maybe get, get your mind around what, what I would recommend um, as you go out west and start to fulfill some of those dreams that you have. So before we get into it, you know the drill. We need to pay the bills. So first, I'd like to thank Moultrie Mobile. Mark Olis and the team over there have been great to work with. Their new Edge Pros are awesome. Last podcast, we covered some of the new products they're coming out with. They are they're really awesome. Um, and specifically the, the cameras are great, but I'm telling you that lithium battery pack and the solar panels, game changers. If you're running anything with the edge footprint next is Tompkins taxidermy. Wayne is working on Hershey's right now. He actually asked for pictures. That's that buck I killed last year. Just an old gnarly warrior deer. Um, I'm super excited to see how that farm hunts with him gone just because I do think, um, he was a dominant deer and, and, I believe that those big, mature, dominant bucks are very territorial. So I'm, I'm hoping that there's a deer out there called Chachi that's number one on my list. I'm hoping that he uh, kind of takes over Hershey's ring and we can make that happen. But the cool thing about Hershey's is, is that he had a blind eye and he always had this really bulged, glassy eye. It was a unique characteristics, how we knew who he was from day one. And Wayne's going to duplicate that. So there's not many taxidermists that can really dive in deep and, and put that level of detail into your mounts. And Wayne's going to do that. So he actually asked for physical pictures and videos of, of him so that he can make sure it's spot on. Next is Dark Knight Outdoors. Jamie over there is running a couple really awesome sales right now. You should go check them out, specifically around iRay. Makes some stuff incredibly affordable. Uh, they also have some of the brand new Pulsar units. What's cool about Dark Knight is that if you can get yourself to their shop, you can actually sit there and look through all their stuff side by side. So if you're indecisive or you don't know exactly which scope or which scanner, what unit you want, you can hold one in your right hand, one in your left hand, put it to your eye, take it down, put the other one to your eye. Something that's really great. Um, last, I would like to thank Pulsar. Been working with those guys, uh, like I said, for several months now. Really looking forward to this partnership uh, in about two and a half months, three months when uh, winter gets here and we start sacking coyotes and coons and other things with them. But uh, the new Pulsar stuff is pretty awesome. They're at a couple shows right now. So their social media has got tons of stuff on their new, their new line of things. Now we will get into the quote of the day. So I'm doing this again, trying to do this on every podcast at the beginning and take it for what it's worth. I don't need to dive into it. I'm not a motivational speaker. Don't tend to be one, but quotes stick to me. So the quote today is, You stop caring about what people think about you when you realize how seldom they do. And uh, that one hits home. I think a lot of people worry too much about what their image is or what people think about them. And when you sit back and realize that, you know, the people that probably judge you really harshly um, or critically or negatively probably don't even really think about you as much as as you really think so. So don't even worry about it. I'll roll off your back. All right. Now let's talk about my fitness for this. I've been active all of my life. I uh, played multiple sports in high school, multiple sports in college, <clears throat> and I've always worked out um, pretty pretty extreme in some fashion. You know, hunting fitness aside, I've been weight training for, I mean, shoot, ever since I graduated. Uh, I run, I do races, um, and and I really kind of enjoy that kind of stuff. So I've never been a big CrossFit guy. I've done several CrossFit workouts uh, I do enjoy doing the Murph every year on Memorial Day, but really for me, I've taken a smattering of everything that I've learned through, you know, football, track, fighting, fitness, you know, and kind of meshed it all together to to make a workout that I like doing that my body reacts well to. That being said, <clears throat> I've changed I change things, especially when I go out west, 
Uh, I really start to focus on my cardio base and, and more so than my cardio base is just my leg strength. Um, when you're in the mountains, you don't realize how critical that is for you to be able to, to move around. And more importantly, it's not, it's not that you have to be able to go, okay, I'm doing a three mile pull and I need to get there in 30 minutes, something not cra- nothing crazy like that. It's, it's the ability to work the mountains to get to where you need to be. And then the next day be able to do it again. Um, Firsthand, I've seen guys, I've been with guys that have gotten ready, quote unquote, and what happens is they'll go out west, they'll be excited, they hit that first day, they hit it hard, and then they wake up the next morning. Mind you, you know, usually you're sleeping in a tent or on a cot. It's not five-star lavish lodging here, and they're locked up. They're they're just, they, they didn't put their legs, their body through that stress, and the rest of the hunt shot because they weren't even ready for it. So I change my my fitness accordingly to what I have coming up. I still weight train, but I like I said, I add a lot of Stairmaster to, to my program. So I usually work out six days a week, five minimum, and I'm doing the Stairmaster. So since July, the beginning of July, I've been getting on the Stairmaster for five days a week minimum. And I typically will put resistance on there. So I'll throw a 45 plate, I'll hold it on my shoulder, on my back, um, and I'll alternate, you know, shoulders for several hundred steps. Or I will do farmer carries with like 25 pound plates or dumbbells. Uh, We have sandbags at my gym. So I'll throw like a 60 pound sandbag on my back and ruck it for a while. But the caveat to this is, is I, I really messed up my back about five weeks ago. Six weeks ago, I started the carnivore diet. I did this just out of uh, personal gain. It has nothing to do with the hunt coming up. And surprisingly, I've, I've leaned down about 13, 14 pounds. Um, spry, you know, you don't realize how much you have. Not saying that I'm uh, some fitness god or anything, but I was pretty, pretty lean, mean, looking all right. But man, now I tell you what, after doing this carnivore diet for about six weeks, uh, no alcohol and carnivore, which is meat-based proteins or animal-based proteins, so eggs and all kinds of other meats. Uh, I, I look good, uh, as, as humbly as I can say that. Um, but week one of that, I was doing deadlifts, and I had a lot of weight on the bar. I had five plates on. It's nothing I haven't done before. Um, I did a set, and I went to go do another one, hit my first rep, pulled it up, set it back down, grabbed, regripped, and went to go hit my second rep. But halfway up, I just felt a big old snap and pop. And my left leg went numb. My ear started ringing. I mean, it felt like a flashbang had gone off and my back was on fire. So when I did that, I dropped the bar, obviously kind of weird. And, and then I like did something goofy to my left shoulder. It was a bad day. It was on a Thursday and it was literally the day before my birthday. I remember that. And um, I went, went to the hospital. I didn't that day, but the next day I did. Got x-rays and had two herniated discs. <clears throat> so I've been fighting that. So that being said... Um, I haven't had any weight on my back. I've been a pretty much a cardio queen and I've been literally just getting on the Stairmaster and doing anywhere from 1500 to 4,000 steps on that thing continuously. Important thing is that you don't hold on. You want to have that resistance on your legs and uh, I've been doing it at different speeds. So finally, um, last Friday, I got a cortisone shot in my back and I was getting progressively better. I'd been going to physical therapy and seeing this uh, spine specialist, <clears throat> and I got the shot, and I feel like a million bucks, man. I mean, holy moly. It uh, Didn't know what to expect. Never had one before. That first day, you know, you, you're kind of numb and stiff, and you don't really feel much. There's a little more pain associated with it. But the following morning, um, I feel great. But I have to make sure that I understand, like, this is just masking it. It's not curing me. So today I actually did some some good workout routine. Um, and I, I didn't do any load on my back, but I, I did the Stairmaster again. And I just, I want to preface that when you're going out there, I think it's super important. You need to have a balance, right? You need to be upper body fit for obvious reasons, but your legs carry you through the mountains. So just make sure that your, your workout regimen shows that. And I don't, you know, a lot of guys hate running. And if you don't like doing running or, or traditional cardio, that Stairmaster is going to still engage your lungs. You're going to breathe. You're going to sweat like, like nobody's business, but you're really going to build the stamina 
in your legs. And that's, that Stairmaster, in my opinion, is the closest thing that can simulate the mountains. Um, moving on to my shooting regiment. So this is an archery hunt that I'm, that I have the tag for. And, uh, you know, it's compound only out there. Well, a compound or longbow. I'm not that, I'm not that skilled. I'm using my Matthews. And, uh, so, so what I've done again, since about July 1st, I started this regimen of working out and shooting. Um, I've been shooting about 20 hours a day. Now, mind you, when I blew my back out, there was about three and a half weeks where I, li- I literally couldn't pull my bow back. So I was super concerned about being able to, to get those reps in, to get that muscle memory in, because I do think that, that whether you're shooting a gun or a bow, and I think it's, it's even more weighted for archery to build up that muscle memory and that strength in your shoulders, your traps, your forearms, to, to be able to hold that bow and hold it steadily so you can make those good shots. So for about the last three weeks, <clears throat> I've been shooting 20 arrows a day minimum, and I've been really focusing the most important shot that I think of the day when I've been practicing is my first one. It's my cold shot. It's that first arrow out of the bow. You know, I, I make sure not to like, you know, some guys will like throw their arms open and stretch their chest or their shoulders. I don't do any of that because most likely in a hunting situation, you're not going to do that. So I want to be cold. Uh, I say cold as in like um, not warmed up. And I want to be kind of stiff as in not stretched out. So that first shot is my most important. And I make sure that I really focus on that. And then I'll shoot that shot. I'll walk down and I'll get it. And then I'll shoot my 20. So technically it's about 21 arrows a night. But I really am a big believer in that. And it does a couple of things. First is that it makes you focus on that shot. It's kind of like when you, if you think about it, you know, all all throughout most of your careers in any type of um, competitive event, you have a warm up. I don't care if it's basketball or if it's football or even paintball, man, you know, you, you like do a couple warm up rounds. Well, when you get into these hunting scenarios, or really there's no, it's not like you're going to, oh, I'm going to wake up in the morning and before I hike to the glassing point, I'm going to shine a light on a target that I decided to pack into the back country and take a couple shots today. It just doesn't happen. So I think it, it makes you focus really hard on each individual shot. And then I also think it really makes you analyze all of the things that you need to do. So I guess that ties into focus. But like for me, when I, when I draw my bow, I have my grip rest kind of some, a little different in my lifeline. So I make sure my grip's right. I have a kisser button on my bow. I've had one on there forever. I'll never take it off. I'll anchor my kisser. I'll touch the string to my nose. And then I'll slowly put my finger on my release trigger. And that kind of like that, that memory, those mechanics is just ground into it. And I think that first shot with me being stiff and not having shot any, it makes me really focus on that repetitive style of, okay, press the bow out, grip is set, kiss her button, nose down, feel the release, slowly pull back, pull the shoulder blades, poof, release the arrow. And, um, and I'll tell you what, I'll be honest with you too. Most times and not, my first shot is my worst shot. And so it just, it humbles you. It makes you realize like that's what you need to do to make sure that you, you're ready for whether you're hunting whitetails or out west doing something. Um, other big thing that I've done is I've switched broadheads. So if you listen to 185, you heard me talk about that. And I had a lot of decisions to make when I was going out west. A lot of, um, a lot of western guys shoot, shoot fixed broadheads, no end ifs or buts. And I love my Exodus heads. But I actually, I'm going to be shooting my severs. I'm almost certain of it because of the opportunity for a longer shot and because a deer just is not the same as like a bear or an elk. Um, so I'm going to be shooting my severs. And the next, the next huge thing that's really, really big is that I actually recently took my single pin off and I went to a seven pin, a multi-pin. It's been a long time since I've had a multi-pin sight on my bow. And I was... You know, Shane and Robert are the guys that live out there. They're both hunting guides. They, they do this all the time. So they live, eat, and breathe. And both of them recommended that I go to a multi-pin. Single pin is fantastic, and I, and I love it. And I fought them on it. I'll be the first one to tell you. I was like, man, I've been, you know, I can practice holdovers and this, that, and the other. And they finally convinced me to, to switch to a multi-pin. And the reason being is that they've said that 
probably one out of 15 deer that they stalk and shoot with a bow. Now, mind you, this is the, not only their hunts, but all the hunters that they guide, that the deer is shot at the same position in which they like get to. So the scenario is kind of this. You find the deer, you work your way, you stalk. Let's say you've done everything right and you get, we'll say 30 yards away, right? You can see the antler tips. Maybe they're bred in some brush or just over what ha- a hill or a knob or in some yuccas. And you just stage up and you sit there and you wait them out because you need to wait for the sun to hit them or you need to wait them to stand up to shift or change. And what they said is like, okay, you've gotten a position, the wind's good, whatever. And they're like, at some point in time, that deer does stand up. And maybe it's because the wind just swirls just a bit and they catch a little bit of you. They don't bust, but they're like, ah, oh, something's not right. Or maybe the sun hits them or they just get up to feed. And they're saying that you can read the deer, right? You can tell when they're getting ready to stand up. So then you draw your bow back and you like for me, you know, okay, have my pen set on 30. Well, they said more times than not that deer will stand up and the chance of them being broadside or giving you uh, some type of quartering shot to shoot is minimal. So then on top of that, you're sitting there holding it because you don't have a shot because maybe they, they stood up and they're facing away from you or, the, you know, there's still some, some obstruction in their vitals. Well, then they see you because it's not like you're in a brush yourself. You just stalked into a position where they couldn't see you from being bedded. Well, now they see you. And more times than not, when they see you, they spook. And so they, they've said that they'll run maybe six yards. Maybe it's 25 yards. But more times than not, they'll kind of bound off a little bit and then stop and look back and check up on you. And that's when your real opportunity comes. So with a single pin, you know, if they run six yards and stop, okay, that's great. But if I have my pin set to 30 and they bound out to like 48, that's a big difference. And when I was shoot, I literally was shooting my bag target. I was taking my pen and like setting the bag target at 42, leaving at 30, measuring and seeing how far the drop was and, and doing that. And to be honest, if it was like under 35, not a big deal. When you start getting past like 40 and especially like 50, man, I don't think I didn't realize how much my arrows dropped in between those yardages. And I'm, I mean, I'm pulling a pretty stout setup and I'm, I'm pushing a pretty quick setup. I mean, my, my arrow is about 530 grains, but, but anyway, it just made me realize that I do need to have that multi-pin capability because if that deer does get up and it does bound and stop and still give me a shot, I can actually have a reference point on my bow without having to let it down, without having to do some type of quick math holdover thing. Just a matter of, you know, one of the guys being like, now he's at the, you know, yardage X now, I have that pin, I can gauge it and make the shot. So that, that seven pin went on my bow this weekend and I've started shooting it. And I will tell you, it's a lot different, man. It's a lot different. Um, not that it won't work and not that I can't shoot it well, I can, but it's just going from that single pin sight picture and especially to dialing. Uh, you know, I found myself like switching targets, like I'm, I'm wanting to reach for my dial. That dial's not there anymore. So We'll see how that works. I do think it's going to be a better archery setup for out west. But when I get home, I can tell you right now, I'm going to put my single pin back on. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, last thing that I want to talk about with shooting-wise is I have a lot of 3D targets at my house. But naturally, the, my deer target last year just got shot up, and I threw it away. So I've got a bag target, a couple hogs, a coyote, a groundhog just some, some targets that I shoot at. And I really wanted to make sure that I got a deer target. And that goes back to like that first shot. My first shot, no matter what, always is on that deer target. And when I mow my yard, I always move my targets around. So they're not in a fixed position. And I always, um, like will quarter them to me, quarter away from where I usually shoot on my back pad, just because it it makes me process where I want to have that arrow. So one thing that I did do is I, I, went to Shields and I bought um, a Delta target and it's okay. It's a smaller target. Like, I mean, I would say that to be honest, you know, it's a buck with antlers, right? It, I'd say the body profile is that of like a yearling doe, not a fawn, but not, but not a big doe by any means. And that's kind of a good thing just because it, it makes you focus up even more. But what I wanted for that deer target is that, okay, first shot that I talked about my cold shot, wanted to make sure that if when I release that arrow and I go up there to look at it and pull it out, is that a lethal shot or not? 
And that's the number one thing. Because if I'm shooting at dots, that's fine. Um, you know, I can be like, oh, I hit, uh, you know, a in couple inches low. Or, oh, as oh, it was an inch right of the bullseye or whatever. But at, more importantly, I just want to make sure that, like, okay, you know, that's a deer. Did I, did I hit something vital? Did I hit where I needed to? Let's get into the gear. Let's get into the expensive part. Um, you know, a lot of us take in to don't take into consideration a lot of the gear we've accumulated as far as cost goes. So, you know, we've been whitetail hunting in the Midwest for such a long time. You've got a cache of stands, you've got ground, maybe you have some ground blinds that you've built or you've bought. Um, you've got all of your, your whitetail pack and you've got your bow and your arrows and your quiver and all this stuff that you've, that you've been able to accumulate that you've built up over the years. And so when you go out West, you find out all of a sudden that all this gear that you've got specifically for the Midwest really doesn't transfer over. And, um, I've, I'm ahead of the game in the sense that I've had, you know, Western style hunting clothing. I've had Western style boots, which I'll never go back to rubber boots, but I've been wearing crispies for the last multiple years. I don't even know how long. And, um, and I've also been able to like understand what I need for these trips. So like I, I have things that I can roll over, but then I also have things that I know will be cost. And what, what do I mean by that? So like I have a Katadyne water filter. That's one of the, my favorite ones that are out there. High flow rate. It has a good holding water reservoir and, uh, and it works really well. So I already had that with an extra filter. Um, jet boil already had one of those and the jet boil, you know, you got to, obviously have water to put into it so I also had some just water holder so you'd use your catadine filter water bolt filter slash water bottle to fill up your water reservoirs which are just big heavy duty plastic bags take those and keep them at camp and then you'd boil that um, even then again boiling is not so much for for necessarily for drinking but for your meals and peak refuels uh, I like gel blocks to pick me up throughout the day. I take the streusel waffles, like the honey stinger style ones. I throw those in my, I mean, I'm talking a ton of them. Um, and, and actually, honestly, one of my other big snacks that I bring are snicker bars just because they're protein, carbs, and sugars. And it gives you that pick you up when, when you need it. Um, other things that I take for like snacks and stuff like that is, um, types of like beef jerky and snack sticks and things that don't weigh a lot, but also but pack a lot of nutrient value. Um, cliff bars are another great thing that I bring again, just because they are high in calories, but you need those when you're out there. And they're also really good at like satiating you. So making you kill that craving. Like when you're hungry, you eat a cliff bar, it kind of sticks to you. You know what I mean? It doesn't just go away. But things that I did buy for this hunt is I did purchase a new pack. I bought a Kafaru Ma Deuce and that is an investment. I'm telling you what, um, Kafaro makes very nice equipment, but it is, it is not cheap being cool. And, um, so I got the, the Ma Deuce and then I got the Sherman pocket for it as well. That's what I'm going to use to carry my bow in, um, on my belly belt. I got a water bottle holder and then I have a micro pouch. Um, and the, the thought behind that is you, you really don't realize how much you need to access your water. So I'll have my water bottle on my left side as well as my micro pouch. My micro pouch is where I'll put maybe my phone and like several candy bars or glue blocks. So like when we are hiking, I can just grab something. I need a quick bite. I don't need to take my pack off, shuck it down, dig into one of my pockets to grab a snack or something. And then on my right side of my belly belt, I actually have a holster. So I'll have my sidearm there accessible too. So I want, I didn't, I wanted to make sure my right side was clean and available you know, heaven forbid you ever had to use it for whatever reason while you're back there, but you can grab, you can grab that sidearm and then my left side is going to be stacked up with my water and my other stuff. Now the Modus is a really big pack. Uh, it's an expedition style pack. It's meant for those five, seven day trips, which is what I'm going to be on. And what I really liked about this of, over some of the other ones are, is the pocket configuration. It's got a great big center storage pouch. It's lid actually has two separate compartments which is nice for separating, you know, things out in between there. And then the two side po- pockets as well are very large. So I'll be able to fit my tripod. I'll be able to fit like a spotting scope in each side. And it's really nice and secured. 
the last thing that I liked about it too is that it had multiple cinch down like um, tethers. So the pack, even though it's really big, if I don't utilize all of the space, these tethers go to the frame and I can cinch it down and make it really minimalistic. The Sherman pocket is honestly my favorite pocket that Kafaru makes. And it's like hybrid use. If I'm not going to be carrying in a gun or a bow, I can fold that pocket up and I get another, you know, 1800 or whatever it is, cubic inches out of there. And that's where I can throw like a stocking cap, snacks, like stuff that I want to get to easily because it's on the outside front main center of, of my pouch. Um, let's talk about glass. As you get out West, you know that like, um, uh, those guys spend ridiculous amounts of money on, on things that we just don't hear in, in the Midwest. And so one of those is, is like glass. And now I, I couldn't justify or afford to jump into like a pair of Zeiss or Swarovski's or Leica's, but, uh, I have a Maven scope right now on my 300 PRC. A glass is fantastic. Um, I, I have nothing but really good things to say about Maven. I don't work with them in any way, shape, or form. And I actually went back to them. So I had a Leupold pair of binoculars. I sold those, and I actually picked up a pair of Maven's B6. And um, they're, they're awesome. Uh, they're, they're a little bit larger than, than the, the Leupolds that I had. But the clarity is just, oh, man, it's, fan, it's fantastic. And I can't tell you how much of a difference that really makes, especially when you're out west and you live in these things. So there was a couple different options. When you go to Maven, you know, they have their, their B1 through 6, and they have a new one, which is a 7, which is kind of like a hobbyist binocular. But the B1 through 6 are really like your hunting applications. And so I ended up going with the, the B6, and I went with the, or I'm sorry, the B2. Jeez, um, the B2, and I went with the 11 by 45. And so that's kind of like their top tier glass. The 11 by 45 is going to be a nice magnification range that's going to give me zoom but stability. And it also has a really good sense of uh, like field of view. So I wanted these binoculars. I'm going to invest in them. I want to be able to use them back at home. I couldn't justify jumping into something crazy like a 12 by 50 or uh, a, one of like their Mac daddies, like 15 by 56 is just because that's way too much power for in the woods here. So I was conflicted between the nine and 45 or limb 45. And then the ones that I had beforehand were a 10 by 50. So I went with the 11 by 45 and I couldn't be any happier. Again, this was an investment that I made. I'm going to have these for 10, 20 years and uh, it was well worth the upgrade. So by selling my Leupolds and buying the Mavens, it defrayed the cost to where it wasn't too arduous to be able to step into them. And uh, I'm really happy with that. Let's look at some of the other miscellaneous gear that I am going to have to, to get or, or that I have bought for this. So one of those kind of weird things that, that nobody ever thinks about when you're going out west, especially like archery hunts, is like when it comes down to the stock. So I have really nice crispy boots. And I'm going to wear them for sure. But I was looking for something to like slip into if we do get into a situation where it's time to get stealthy quiet. And so I bought a pair of just El Cheapo. They're like rubberized socks on Amazon. I don't, I don't even remember what they're called, but they, I think they're going to work perfect. Um, there's, some, there's a brand out there called a Stockison, and it's exactly designed for this. So when you find a mule deer, like typically we're going to always have our packs on. And when we get like maybe 200 yards out or something like that, we'll drop the packs and make our final stock. And at that time, that's where you would like either double or triple layer up your socks or you would put on your stockasins. Some guys will literally wear Hey Dudes, something that's a lot more nimble and has a much softer sole so you don't make near as much noise when you're stalking. Well, I found these things on Amazon that's like a thick wool sock, but the entire bottom of it and like the front of your toe has been dipped in this texturized rubber material. So a couple things, it slips on super fast. I don't need to worry about laces. I don't need to worry about um, any type of, of latch system. Like some of them out there all have like a, a, like a Velcro strap. Definitely don't want that. I was looking at some of them out there have like a uh, one inch t tether that you like strap around your ankle and then pull it tight around your foot to keep it on you. What's nice about this, I literally just slip it on and it's secure enough that 
I mean, I'm not going to be running. I'm going to be moving really slow. I don't think I'm going to have to worry about it coming off at all. I also like the fact that I do have, rather than just doing like two layers of socks or something, like slipping on another pair of big wool socks, that I have a little bit of puncture protection. I mean, it's it's not like a hard rubber sole. It's damn sure not that. But again, I feel like stepping on a thorn with these compared to a thorn with a couple layers of socks, big difference. And lastly, the other thing too is like, I like that there is a little bit of waterproofing to it. Not that it's the end of the world, but I just know that if if there's a dew or if it's kind of moist at all, like my feet aren't going to be wet. And that's a big thing because if the stock is blown, well, I got to take my, whatever your stocking things are and stick them back in my boots and hike around. And so I just didn't want to have, I wanted to have the ability to maybe not have wet socks. Um, something else that I bought was Velvet Lock. Now this is being optimistic, um, but there's a company out there that makes this, that's called Velvet Lock. It's about 30 bucks and you spray it on the antlers of a velvet animal and it's supposed to preserve them and lock them. You don't need to freeze dry them. You don't need to inject them. It really helps keep that velvet nice, secure, clean and on your antlers. And I did a lot of research into these because of course the company's going to tell you that it's the latest and greatest thing and that it works fantastic. But what really kind of swayed my decision is after looking at Amazon, I looked at Shields, I looked at Academy, Sportsman Warehouse, and their website itself at all the reviews. And I saw multiple taxidermists talk about how they were skeptical or how they'd use it for the first time and were impressed with it. And the fact that I began to find these reviews from different individuals on different sites and specifically from taxidermists, guys that have used other traditional ways, injecting formaldehyde or freeze drying, um, and them profess that they think it's a good product and work is what made me jump into it. So um, I'm going to be packing that with me. The concept behind it is that if you do harvest a, a, a velvet animal, you saturate the antlers with this product as soon as possible. It soaks into the velvet and it preserves it and it's that easy. So I'm hoping that A, I get to use it and B, it works as well as, as they say it will. And so I guess the last thing to talk about is the tag itself. So Western states, almost all of them, uh, you have to do a point style system, a point style draw or application. And so I've been applying for several states with and racking up points. And the way that it works in Colorado is that you have to buy a small game license. And then once you have that for a non-resident like ourselves, then you can apply for all of your points. Now, the points are relatively cheap to get. They're only about 10 bucks a piece, but you got to pay about $100 for that non-resident hunting license that you're probably not going to use. But anywho, you stack up your points, and your points accumulate year after year, and then you can apply for a tag. Now, the nice thing about Colorado's system is that if you apply for it and you don't get it, no harm, no foul, you get a point. If you apply for it and you do get it and you defray it, no harm, no foul, you can still keep your points. And I'm almost certain on that. Um... And so the way that it worked with this is that I had stacked up some points. I obviously had Shane and Robert to help me kind of figure out some of the units that had better draws with the number of points that I had and units that they were familiar with. And uh, lo and behold, I was able to grab a tag. And again, I couldn't have done it without, honestly, the help of, of the Robert, Robert and the Hawk family. They've been super helpful. But that is, uh, in a nutshell, what I've got going for me. So this podcast is going to launch on... Monday the 14th, and so it's kind of crazy to think about that, uh, that even though it launches on the 14th, I mean, man, I'm, I'm leaving on like September 1st to head out there, and I'll be hunting the week of, the, of Labor Day, so boy, this, it's coming up quick, uh, I just got to stick to my regiment. Uh, I will say this, I, did, I, I have it on my outline here that I didn't talk about, is um, my carnivore diet, I'm going to sunset that on the 20th. So there's, I don't want to go out to uh, Colorado high country being carb depleted. So uh, on the 20th of August, I'm going to kill that, which is Sunday. I'm going to end that diet. I'm going to start eating normally again. Not like I'm going to go crazy and order pizza and Italian and all that other stuff. But I wanted to make sure that I had two weeks of, of regular eating to, to bring it back and incorporate it into my digestion system. That way I don't have any issues there. And uh, to get kind of carb loaded for when I go back out there. So I'm juiced up, if you will. But other than that, 
You guys are fantastic. If you uh, want to tag along with that, make sure you stick around the Last Breath Inner Circle and our and my social media because when I do have service and where I do have service, I'll be giving um, updates as much as I can. Uh, Last Breath Inner Circle is going to see it first, and uh, followed by that, I'll throw it on social media. So thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next one. And as always, don't waste it.